In this lecture, we will discuss urea cycle. This is the fifth lecture of our series. Urea cycle is very important and is always asked in the exams in the viva. Before starting this urea cycle, I will first tell you some background about this. This urea cycle was elucidated in 1932 by Hans Krebs and Gerst. And Hanslet. Hence the cycle is known as Krebs Hanslet urea cycle. As ornithine starts this cycle, it's the first member of the reaction. It is also known as ornithine cycle. Urea, as I told you, is composed of two amino groups linked with the carbonyl group. The two nitrogen atom of urea have two different sources. One is the ammonia and the other source I told you in the previous lecture is from aspartate or aspartic acid that comes from the alpha amino group of the <coughs> aspartic acid. Now before starting the urea cycle there are some important points to remember. Number one is where does the urea cycle begin? How many enzymes participate in the urea cycle? What is the difference between CPS1 and CPS2? Now, urea cycle starts in the liver and takes, it starts from mitochondrial matrix. Remember this, urea cycle starts in the mitochondrial matrix of the liver. Now, this ammonia that comes from the blood glutamine it condenses with two molecules, one is bicarbonate and two ATP, it uses these molecules. So these three molecules condense to form a compound that is known as carbamyl phosphate. This carbamyl phosphate that is synthesized is catalyzed by a very important enzyme, very important enzyme that is known as carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1 or CPS, CPS1. Now if there is CPS1 there must be a second enzyme CPS2 and where it is situated? It is situated in the cytosol and used in pyrimidine pathway. Please remember this carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1 this because this there is a lot of importance of this enzyme. This enzyme is highly regulated. Remember this enzyme is present in the mitochondria of the liver. It is highly regulated. It is not regulated by hormones. It is regulated by a compound known as an acetyl glutamate. Now from where does this N-acetyl glutamate come from? It comes when we eat a high protein meal. This high protein meal signals the formation of N-acetyl glutamate. This N-acetyl glutamate is produced in response to a high protein meal. Because there is a lot of nitrogen in high protein meal, so our body wants to get rid of that nitrogen. So this N-acetyl glutamate is formed. This N-acetyl glutamate turns on the enzyme carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1 or CPS1. So I repeat high protein meal stimulates the formation of N-acetyl glutamate and this in turn activates the enzyme CPS1. Now another important point is that this N-acetyl glutamate is not an allosteric regulator of this enzyme CPS1 but it is an obligate activator of this enzyme CPS1. This means that it is a must that N-acetyl glutamate to be present for the activation of this enzyme CPS1. If this N-acetyl glutamate is not present, this cannot be activated. That it is mandatory. 
that means it is obligate activator mean that it is mandatory allosteric enzymes can work on their own but when the activator is present they work better but an obligate activator it cannot work without an activator so the presence of this n acetyl glutamate is a must if it it is absent this enzyme will not work it's like a car car's key if you have the key you can start the car if you don't have the key the car won't start so this enzyme works like this now when carbamyl phosphate is formed there is another enzyme that acts on it that is known as ornithine transcarbamylase or otc this ornithine transcarbamylase or otc acts on ornithine and condenses it with carbamyl phosphate to form citrulline remember this whole reaction is taking place in the mitochondria when citrulline is formed it leaves the mitochondria and enters the cytoplasm now once citrulline is in the cytoplasm another enzyme works on it that enzyme is known as aginosuccinate synthetase it acts on citrulline and it condenses citrulline with aspartate and forms aginosuccinate now remember this aspartate this gives the second nitrogen atom for the formation of urea i repeat aspartic acid condenses with citrulline to form aginosuccinate the enzyme is aginosuccinate synthetase and this aspartic acid brings in the second nitrogen that forms urea in the process it uses an atp now on aginosuccinate another enzyme acts that is aginosuccinate lyase it acts on aginosuccinate and it cleaves it into two molecules one is fumarate and second is arginine now arginine is formed this carries the nitrogen which is transferred by aspartate second nitrogen that is transferred by aspartate this arginine is a non essential amino acid for adults but it is classified in semi essential or conditionally essential amino acids because it is required in growth and convalescence especially it is required it is essential for children in the growth period in adults it is a non essential amino acid arginine is, is non essential as you can see it is synthesized in the urea cycle now this carries the second nitrogen which is contributed to formation of urea now another enzyme acts on arginine this enzyme is arginase and it splits the arginine into two the first molecule formed is the urea and the second molecule that is formed that is ornithine this ornithine will go back into the mitochondria and then again it will take part in urea cycle it will combine again with citrulline with carbamyl phosphate to form citrulline and this citrulline will again come in the cytoplasm and the cycle will, will continue now you can see the enzymes that were used in the urea cycle 1 2 3 4 and 5 there are total five enzymes that are incorporated in the urea cycle now it is very important to remember that arginine is a non essential amino acid for adults but for growing children this arginine is not enough they need a lot more arginine so it has to be taken in the, into the diet 
so it is essential for children but not for adults the once arginine is cleaved into ornithine ornithine goes back into mitochondria to com continue the cycle and the urea urea is dumped into the blood the urea form is dumped into the blood and it can easily cross the membrane so it leaves the liver cytoplasm and enters the blood from blood it is carried into the kidneys where it is filtered and it is excreted into the urine now there is a test that measures the amount of urea in the blood and that is the blood urea nitrogen this measures the amount of urea in the blood now you must know the normal urea level in the blood and you must know how much urea is daily synthesized and how much urea is daily excreted in the urine BUN is used to measure the working of two very important organs if BUN is too high then kidneys are malfunctioning that means kidneys are not working properly and they are not excreting the urea form but if BUN is low that means liver is not functioning and liver is not making urea now remember I repeat again that if BUN blood urea and nitrogen is high in the blood then the kidneys are not functioning properly that means liver is making urea okay but it is not excreted through kidney and it is pulling up in the blood so it will raise the BUN level but if the BUN level is low then liver is not making urea so it is low that means the liver is it is not functioning properly due to disease there may be cirrhosis or something like that is affecting the liver so it is not making urea properly now some more questions arise here that can be asked in viva what is uremia uremia is high urea level in blood high urea or raised urea level in blood is known as uremia okay this completes our urea cycle and inshallah next we will see you in other lectures <coughs> there are other pathologies related with this urea cycle that we will discuss at some other time but this at this point urea cycle is complete and i have told you some important questions related to it you must remember it for your viva exam and OSP and MCQs. So, see you again. Goodbye.